Most of my work has been fueled by a desire to merge my, what I call my art self and my architectural self. So from a very young age, both of these were a strong interest for me. And I studied and practiced architecture. I studied at Cornell University and then practiced in the San Francisco Bay Area for about six or seven years, and then left to do my fine art full time. So I sort of made this very, at least in my mind, this very strong break between an architectural practice and a contemporary art practice. And in the last few years, I've fused them back together with a project called Colored Theory. It's a mesh of my concerns and interests about the South Side of Chicago, which is primarily African American and is very low in density and population and has suffered from neglect and underutilization and lack of resources. Um, and then my sort of artistic side, loving painting and color in particular. And having been formally trained in color theory, but also always understanding that coming from a very segregated city, that race is always at the forefront of my mind. And so you can't say something like color without thinking of race. And so colored theory is really the combination of trying to think about the social, political, racial undertones that exist within discussions about urban environments and urban design. So the Color Theory Project really specifically began with an interest in extending an idea about color theory. So I teach color theory as a college professor. Imagine if I came in a lineage of uh, Yosef Albers and Ittens and even Le Corbusier, who was also an architect and a painter who developed a polychromy palette, which he worked with Salubra, which was a paint company at the time, um, in the 30s and then again in the 50s to develop this very custom palette that then he'd have a way to help clients understand um, color combinations for either interior uses, but also larger applications for uh, flattening, expanding space, um, experimenting with workers' housing. There was a long history he had with color. And so really thinking about what would be my contribution if I were in this lineage of this conversation and knowing that my unique perspective as this African-American woman who had been trained in this very um, elite academic realm but that had been born and raised in this very kind of working class environment that's now even deteriorated on the south side of Chicago. So the palette was colors that I thought would be recognizable or kind of collectively understood by people that were from the environment that I was from. And so that they are experts in these colors and this palette that's used in their environment either as a commercial product or something that dots the landscape. So for example, a currency exchange is a popular kind of place in, in Chicago, the Midwest in general, where you can cash your check or you can pay your utility bills. So this is used by a class of people that usually don't have a bank account, but they're brightly colored in yellow. And then the words say currency exchange in red. So it's a very identifiable piece of architecture, but that's associated with a color before a style. So in a city like Chicago, where there's the Prairie style and there's Frank Lloyd Wright and there's Mies van der Rohe, the home of so much great architecture, with a capital A, what's this lowercase a architecture about and, and how could I classify it using color? So a lot of the other colors in the palette come from products that also might be heavily marketed in these environments. So two are hair care products, Ultra Sheen and Pink Oil Moisturizer. So these were hugely popular in the 70s and they're very strange colors. So I can just remember in childhood having these things in the household, these large vat of this neon bluish hair grease. And then the pink oil came in this bottle and was used for seemingly everything related to your hair. So when I mention these colors, when I'm in these neighborhoods, people go, oh yes, of course, oh yes, of course. So the idea to take those colors, take them out of their commercial context and then apply them in these very abandoned, lighted, sort of isolated urban residential conditions as a way to call attention to the pervasiveness of, of kind of this imbalance of, of space and, and race. So much of my, my undergraduate study was believing that architecture could, could change the world. And during my thesis, which was also based here in Chicago, I realized that the layers of complexity of the types of issues I was concerned with were so thick that architecture could barely scratch the surface. So it was this moment of like sadness and depression and then knowing, thinking about how to adapt that. So I really did decide in that moment that architecture could only be a catalyst and it could trigger change or it could trigger a lot of things. And so the same exact object, the form, a Miesian building on lakefront 
that's a thousand dollars a day to live in or something, a million dollars to buy a condo, that same structure when placed with no resources is called a housing project and is the site of all manner of, of societal ills. So that the form is kind of irrelevant without thinking about the rest of the context, despite how we're trained as architects to believe that we can design the thing that's going to save the children or educate them or make the world better. Um, so that had been kind of how I thought of things. And so I'm actually pretty shocked that this project, this color theory project, with a few gallons of paint from the hardware store, seems to be sparking a lot of dialogue about change, about a lot of people having opinions that didn't have opinions or feeling empowered to voice those opinions because, because of what I look like or because of where I've chosen to put the project. So it really has made me sort of question this assumption that I had that it, it wasn't really possible, that there were a lot of limitations, that in fact, art and architecture can be the spark in, in a much more impactful way than I'd given it credit for previously.